Thank you so much, Jason. And thanks for the invitation. Um, I have, I realized your backgrounds are quite diverse. Uh, you're more than welcome to stop me if you have any short questions. But when Jason and I planned this, we figured it's probably better if I try to take us through the main things. Again, interruptions are fine, but if you have long questions, let's save them towards the end. In particular, I'm going to do a walkthrough, and then it's also easier for me to, hey, show you other stuff you're interested in, or even if there are some other topics you want me to address. Um, but since I wasn't really that sure about your backgrounds, what I figure I'm going to try to tell you a little about is partly molecular simulations with Gromax, but possibly also molecular simulations in general. Um, in particular, if you haven't used MD, what are the things that you possibly should consider using it for? But just as important, where are the cases where you should not use it? Uh, because it's as popular as the technique has become, it's certainly misused in a whole lot of cases too. So what I figured I'm going to take you through today, kind of three broad areas. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time in the beginning really giving you the backdrop of simulations. I don't think I'm going to take you through a single equation, actually. Oh, well, yes, there is one. Um, but uh, I'm going to, I'm going to try to focus and give you a couple of examples of the things that we can do, the type of results we can get from MD without necessarily being an MD expert and getting a supercomputer and instantly starting to run months and months and months of simulations. Because these techniques can be quite useful, even if you're a completely experimental group and you would just like to confirm some things, for instance, from an X-ray structure. But that also touches on the other important point is that there are a whole lot of things that you should not be using MD for, and I will get back to that. Then I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about Gromax. The one thing that I'm not going to touch at all, I'm not going to tell you anything about the code. I'm not going to give you the background. There are papers you can read if you're interested in that. There are plenty of tutorials online. I'll try to point you to them instead. But I'm going to try to introduce you a little bit. What are the questions you should think about before you even start doing any AMD simulations in the first place, and also where you find all these resources? And then I figured with this great online format, uh, it's kind of stupid just to sit here and show you some boring slides. So I'm going to try to take you through at least a brief tutorial. It's going to be super short, so you don't have to sit here and wait for my simulations. But uh, showing you how I would set up and run a simulation, give some comments as we go along. And then at least I'm going to give you some sneak peeks into some of the more advanced stuff that, for instance, my and a whole lot of other groups are using in simulations today. But uh, you know what? Uh, let's start right away with uh, the things that I think, oh, let's see. And now things are not moving here. It's probably, well, it doesn't matter. The protein there would rotate if this had been a simulation, which it is. You're going to have to take my word for it. Um, but when it comes to simulations, there are a bunch of things that it's so easy to get fooled by. And if we start at the bottom of the slide here, a simulation is not an exact prediction of motion. Sorry, I can't give you that. Nobody can give you that. And that really comes back to Heisenberg and the uncertainty principle and everything. Unless you know the exact position and the exact velocity of every single atom in the universe, you will not be able to predict molecular motion exactly. So having said that, it might be time to close shop and go home, right? Well, not so fast. Um, there are other things simulations can't do. They can't replace experiments. As beautiful as these visualizations look like, and there are some jaw-dropping ones online, these are just numbers on screens and renderings. They don't really tell you anything. Rather, they tell you that it's beautiful, but they certainly don't tell you whether this was a really crappy model and a beautiful visualization, or if it was actually a really well-produced model and, hey, the guy who just did the visualization might not have been a genius. Um, single oxidations and simulations are completely pointless because all this is based on statistical mechanics. And if you throw a dice 100 times, I can kind of guarantee you that you're going to get six at least once. If you see something once in a simulation, that's just a statistical fluctuation. And I think coming from an experimental background, some of those things are really the hardest ones to grasp. On the other hand, looking at the top here, the things that's where simulations, I would argue, excel is really moving away from, say, the single confirmation that you might have had in X-ray and starting to think much more in terms, you could argue, similar to NMR, sampling lots of conformations, understanding the conformational flexibility of the molecule, what parts of the molecule are kind of breathing a bit. That was what you would have seen in this movie had it worked. Um, observing transitions. Can you see two side chains flipping? Can you see, say, a ligand bound in the middle of this molecule? Would you be able to see that ligand bind in a slightly different way? 
Uh, it turns out that simulations that are actually awesome at calculating free energy. So I can actually calculate binding affinities quite accurately. And in the best case, this is a beautiful way for us to use simulations to understand function. Let's see. Oh, yes, I can get it moving. Beautiful. If everything else fails, read the manual. Um, and as you see here, these motions, when it's just a single small protein, this might not be the end of the world. This might not be so important, but this can really help us understand things. Why is it that we're not seeing, say, a cysteine crosslink in a protein where what I would what I would expect to see it? Well, because the simulation might tell you that this chain will point another way when the channel is, say, in a closed state. So rather than seeing this as a way of predicting motions, I think that you should try to think of this as the world's most powerful Gedanken experiment. Um, it's amazing what the computers can do, but the computers will not do anything you don't tell the computer to do. So be careful with your simulations because the computer will probably do exactly what you tell it to do. Crap in, crap out. So instead of going through everything simulations can do, I figured that I should show you two brief examples that are actually not by far not the best simulations we have done. But these are rather experimental collaborations where the simulations have been surprisingly small, but the combined experimental simulation work actually turned out to be really nice, and we got it into nice publications in the end, too. And the first of these is a, an example of a ligand-gated ion channel. These are really important and cool proteins sitting in your nerve cells. So if you have a glass of alcohol this weekend, the alcohol will bind to these channels, and it will actually either inhibit or potentiate the channel to influence the nerve signals. So this is kind of an alcohol receptor, not quite. It turns out that these channels are really difficult to understand experimentally because sometimes these small ligands potentiate the channels, they open them more. Sometimes they have the exact opposite effect. We could never understand this experimentally and neither could our colleagues until we actually started to run a very large set of systematic simulations. So what is the difference between one type of channel? What is the difference if we mutated one residue, the other residue, pairs of residues, et cetera? And in this particular case, it turned out that with just a couple of days of simulations, what you see here up on the right is that the wild type had a big cavity here in the red place. And in the wild type structure, there is where, for instance, the ethanol would bind. And then by introducing just a single site mutation, this channel becomes much more similar to a human channel, in fact. And in this case, you might see the large there, well, the pink or uh, pink area on the right hand. So it turns out that for this second channel, there are actually two places where these ligands can bind. Now, you can calculate lots of the cavity volumes here and everything, but I think the cool thing for us was that the simulation per se wasn't amazingly cool. It was 200 nanoseconds. I could run this in 24 hours on my laptop. But the point here is that the simulations helped us realize there is likely a second binding site. And then we were able to do a bunch of experimental confirmations here and really showing that how this really agrees with the volume where we start to see the difference from one molecule binding to another molecule binding, which led to a really beautiful PNAS paper. And what you see in the bottom is really that we then continued this work and show that we can even take these channels and by using simulations, calculate with free energies exactly how much it costs to bind different molecules and use this to really engineer molecules. So I can take a membrane protein and cause it to behave in the exact opposite way to, for instance, anesthetics, which we see on the lower right. The second example is also a membrane protein and the line channel. You might start to see a pattern here about my research interests, guilty as charts. Uh, and I'll show you that plot too. The point with these channels is that this has been a really well-studied channel, in particular, these small voltage sensors you have in the outer part of the channel up on the left. The voltage sensor you see in the middle of the top part. And the big fight in this area has been on how the bluish helix in the background there moves. So both we and others have run a bunch of really expensive simulations where we then have tried to predict what happens if you add a voltage? Can we say with a couple of microsecond simulations exactly how these parts will move? It turned out in this case that we got, I think the, the nicest results we got here was actually not by starting from simulations, but by starting from electrophysiology, which we have down on the left. We're deriving a bunch of different constraints, that is pairs of residue that we believe should be in contact based on the electrophysiological recordings. And then we could introduce these simulations. And again, in remarkably short simulations, one that I could do in a day or two in my laptop, we were able to then derive a whole series of different intermediate confirmations that you see down on the left. 
and really map out the entire voltage, the entire cycle, trace the entire cycle as these voltage sensors go from a fully open state to a fully closed state. And the cool thing is that roughly two years after these simulations, the closed structures have now been confirmed experimentally, but the intermediate structures are still just MD predictions. So my point here is not, there are certainly cool things you can do with simulations, but I keep being amazed how cool things that I as a simulation person can do when I collaborate close with experimentalists. And in particular, if you're not an expert, not a theoretician yourself, I really think this is the way you should see simulations. See, this is a way to make thought experiments about your simulations where you, for instance, in electrophysiology, can get the atomic detail that's hard to get in experiments. So if we rather look at a very simple simulation like water here, uh, simulations are really easy. This is the only equation I'm going to have in the talk. Uh, you integrate Newton's equations of motion. The first one says that's force equals mass times acceleration. So if I know the force in atoms, I can calculate how they move. And if I that force I get from the derivative of the potential, which is all the positions of the atoms. Given this, you might think that we can somehow predict the motions of molecules. The problem is that there are simply too many degrees of freedom and we don't know the data that exactly. So the point of a simulation is not to really create the type of movie I showed you here, but the point of a simulation is really to explore this, the free energy landscape. And ideally, we will be able to sample the entire landscape. You can only do that for a very small system. I probably could do that for the water here, but for a protein or a membrane protein or an even larger system, there is no way I can sample more than a very, very small part of this phase space. The good thing is that I don't need to sample all of phase space. In this figure, the low, the blue low-lying parts here are the only important regions. That's where we're going to spend 99.9% .9 of the time. And it turns out that MD simulations provide an awesome way of sampling all these low-lying states. And that's the other take-home message that I want you to have from this talk. Simulations are not about prediction at least not accurate predictions of motions of individual particles, but it's really about sampling these overall parts of phase space. And you can certainly sample motions, but I can sample average motions and by collecting hundreds or even thousands of trajectories, I can predict what average motions are, but never forget that this is based on statistical mechanics. This is primarily about sampling, not about predicting a specific trajectory. The other cool thing that simulations can do is that in many ways, simulations can actually be, I wouldn't say more exact, but they can treat a problem in a better way than say an X-ray structure or an NMR structure can do. We certainly can't get the same experimental resolution as you would get from a higher resolution X-ray crystal. But a simulation can, in this case, I think it's a tannin in red wine you're showing here with the alcohol in gray. With the simulations, I can easily include all the water and I can study the dynamics in the water around the molecule. And I can do that by literally putting a flag on every atom. If it's a membrane protein, I can study exactly how not just every lipid moves, I can introduce a different type of lipid. I can check how cholesterol 14 binds. So that simulations are good in many of the ways where these experimental techniques are really weak. And on the other hand, of course, simulations are really weak in some of the regions where the experimental techniques are strong, in particular when it comes to providing absolute answers. So, what a typical simulation is about is really that we start from a structure somewhere, and I'm going to take you through this in a minute or two. We need to look at these PDB files because there could be, again, the computer will just work with what you give it. Uh, if there are horrible parts of the uh, region, things clashing, segments or sites missing, we typically have to fix that, either manually or with a program.
that's all the chemical knowledge. That might seem really stupid. Don't we have the chemical knowledge in the program? Well, the problem is that in a simulation, in contrast to reality, there is more than one truth. So every group, words that salt, have developed their own parameters. Well, not quite. I try not to get into this religion, but you should know there is an insane amount of religion in these force fields. 10 or 20 years ago, this was something that you should worry about a lot because not all, not all force fields were good. I would even argue that quite a few of them were good. Today, I would argue that all of the major force fields are going to do a really good job of producing a simulation of a vanilla protein-like hemoglobin we have here. And then there are, of course, just as there are differences in experimental equipment and everything, some are going to be better for pro problem type A, while others excel at problem type B. But worry about that when you get there. And then on the lower left, we're going to need someone to tell the computer what to do. Should we simulate a million steps or should we simulate a billion steps? or what temperature do you want to do this at? In many cases, if you want to compare with an X-ray experiment, you might actually prefer to simulate at 100 Kelvin. And then you put all this stuff together, and if we're lucky, we should see some sort of simulation coming out, which you see down on the right there. And I think this is part of a small simulation we ran years ago in folding at home. So here we see the small protein BBA5 that actually folded here in 34 to 90 nanoseconds. I think it's 42. But that was just one of very many simulations. At this point, we've used roughly 15 minutes. Instead of taking you through this in slides, I figured I'm going to take you through this and do a quick demo and show how I would work with the simulation in practice, because I think that's going to be much more useful for you. And then I can get back to a couple of these slides at least later. So Jason helped me set things up here. So hopefully you're going to be able to see that I do a listing here. Yeah. And I have prepared a small traject, uh, sorry, a small directory with an SP grid tutorial here. You do not have to sit down and take detailed notes here because I deliberately picked a problem that's very similar to one of the tutorials that we used in Gromax. I'm going to give you pointers to all these tutorials once I'm done with this walkthrough. And then you can find the longer versions of this tutorial online, even in a click through fashion. The one thing I have in this directory is a protein. One AKY, AKI, and that's a version of lysozyme grabbed directly from the protein data bank today. Some of you are X-ray crystallographers and you know all about this. Sorry for repeating it. Those of you who are not, never just pick a structure and start simulating it. You need to be aware where did this structure come from? Are there any problems in the structure? Um, again, if everything else fails, read the documentation. These the files are full of remarks. In this case, the beamline details, you don't need to know that. But it might suddenly say in a remark here that there is, say, one side chain that is missing some atoms or that was a loop they could not resolve. At some point, you will likely bump into that problem. And sorry, this is something that the computer can't magically fix for you. You need to understand both what the features and problems of your molecules are. So let's see what we can do with Gromax with this small molecule. In this case, you're going to have to take my word for the fact that it's OK. Gromax is already installed on my computer. I'm not going to take you through that. That's documented online. But typically, when I use Gromax, uh, you know what? I'll let you in a secret. I can't remember all these commands, not even in Gromax. So we have a bash cell script that I can source. In this case, it's a user local Gromax, then gmxrc. This sets up my environment. So first that I will find the Gromax binaries. Uh, if you look at some old tutorials, you might have the binary names might not match. We merged everything into one binary now to make the distribution 10 times smaller. Uh, but this also sets up manuals, command line completions or something in pretty cool ways. So I can type GMX here, and then I should be able to hit tab. And when I hit tab, I'm going to see every single possible way I can continue to complete this command. So the first command is that I'm going to convert from PDB to GMX. And we have a command for that that's called PDB to GMX. And PDB to GMX takes a number of arguments, in particular five. And in this case, this file argument will only accept one file. Well, I only have one file in my directory. So PDB to GMX will take this PDB structure, and I'm going to tell it to execute. There are tons of options that you can find online here, but I will only show you the short version here. So the first thing PDB to GMX is going to ask you about all these different force fields. And there are at least 15 of them in Gromax. 
you can spend a week reading up on this, or if you don't know what to use and if you're working with proteins, pick Amber 99 SBILDN. It's an awesome force field. I would argue that Amber 99 SBILDN is better, significantly better than Amber 03. I would still argue that it's better than Amber 11. That's up to you to decide, but don't assume that a more modern force, force field is better by design here. You might see that the SBILDN force field is from 2010. Once I've done that, it's going to ask me for a water model. There are different ways of representing water. I won't go into those details here. I just pick the default recommended value. And boom, then you see lots of text. This is the other take home message here. Gromax tools can be really, really, really picky. Sorry about that. But that's actually something good. Because when you run through a Gromax tool and it does not complain or give you warnings or anything, you can count to 99% probability at least that those are just informational uh, informational statements up there. So in this case, unless the program compile, complains loudly, we are fine. And this produces the information we need, actually. So we have a file called topple.top. You can change these file names. We can even give them, but I like the default file names. If I have a look at the topology, the topology just really describes every single atom in my structure what is the partial charge, what is the mass, et cetera. And then eventually we're going to get to a point, if I search for bonds here, eventually it's going to get to a point where it describes how all the atoms are connected, what angles and what torsions and everything is in the molecule. This file in turn includes the force fields at the top. If you use the programming C, you will probably see that this syntax is completely borrowed from C and C++ compilers. So that topple.top top file includes all the chemical description of the molecule. Conf.grow, that's another representation of the coordinates. That's really stupid. We just had a PDB file. Well, the problem is that there are some things that are missing in the PDB file. In particular, hydrogens are missing in most PDB files. Uh, and for that reason, Growbex can actually use PDB files for coordinates. But once you run a simulation, you typically want to store velocities and some other things. So in most cases, people prefer to use separate core file formats that can actually uh, store velocities too. But if you're a person that likes PDB files, you are perfectly fine to work with them. We could have had this conf.pdb instead. The one thing that this does not contain is the third thing, the parameters. Where are we going to get those from? Well, there are a couple of tricks to get these parameters and generate them from scratch if uh, you've forgotten how they work. I'm not going to do this but I'm, because it takes some time, but I'm rather going to copy them from the directory where I've prepared the parameters. So my first parameter file I'm going to show you is called em.mdp. Em stands for energy minimization. And this is a list that contains small statements that some parameter equals a value. So why do I need to start with an energy minimization? Well, the problem is that that structure I got from the PDB is not perfect. Atoms will overlap a bit. The water are, I, I'm going to need water in this state, and my water will overlap with the structure and everything. So I'm going to need to, I'm not really interested in minimizing energy, but we want to get rid from those horrible peaks in energy before we start a simulation. Or I might get velocities that are equivalent to the speed of light, and then things are going to crash. But there is something else we need first. Uh, this confirmation that I had about conf.grow, that is really just a copy of the PDB file. So that's all the atoms, but the size of the cell and everything, that comes from the crystal structure, and that's probably not what you want. We have a program that can deal with this called editconf. And editconf takes a file option, that F. You probably start to see the pattern here. And then we're going to write this to something. So dash O, that's always the output version of Gromax. I write it to box.grow. I could call it box.pdb if I wanted. So Gromax will set the file formats based on the name. And if I don't do anything here, I can just do that. Well, and it's just going to make a copy of the input to the output. But I can also tell it to create a new box. I can say the box type here should be a cubic box. And the distance between, say, my protein and the side of the big box might be 0.75. Sorry about that. Gromax is developed in Europe, so we like to stick to system international units. Every single unit in Gromax is in nanometers rather than angstroms, which is really stupid because angstrom was a Swede, so I guess we should be patriotic and use angstrom. We don't. It's nanometers. 
we get a bunch of information here. You don't really need to worry about this. Uh, all this data said it took my protein and put my protein in the center of a box that was larger. And it's actually significantly larger, roughly three times the original box size. I could look at this box now if I wanted to, uh, but in the interest of time, I'm going to add some water before I show you the box. So I want to solvate my protein in the water. And the way to do that is that I have a program called DMX solvate. And the input might be dash F. In this case, it's actually not going to be that. Uh, so DMX solvate takes a number of different arguments here. And in this case, I didn't remember, so I just added a dash H option, and then I get some help here. And the reason why I just can't take one single input file is that I'm going to need two inputs here. One coordinates for protein, CP, and one coordinate for solvent, CS. Well, I'm not going to use the water solvent because I will just pick up the default one there. So I'm going to use DMX solvent dash CP. That was my box. CS I don't have to use. I could use that if I wanted to pick a different solvent. I want to write this somehow, and let's call that solvate to grow. And then I'm going to ask you to, you know what, automatically edit this topology and add all the water molecules you're adding there to the chemical information, because now there is water in the system too. If I do this, I get another bunch of lines. And the one thing I have to look at is that there were no horrible warnings here. It just that it added almost 10,000 water molecules. So I'm not really simulating a protein. I'm mostly simulating water with a tiny amount of protein in it. We can look at this now, and we don't have to look at it with ls. I could have called the output file solvated.pdb, or I can use this command edit conf and use from solvated.grow, write a file called solvated.pdb. Oops. Let's see if I did something right. Uh, I need to prepare that with GMX. I love my Macs, and the reason for my Macs is that I have all my programs installed. In this case, I can have a look at this in uh, V, uh, sorry, in PyMol. So I can just open solvate.pdb, and it's going to open PyMol for me, which now goes on my other screen. So I'm going to need to show you that. So here you see the protein in its box. It's probably going to be a bit jerky due to the video, which looks beautiful. So this we can simulate. I'll close that. So now I have the coordinates with the water. I have these parameters, em.mdp, and I have the chemical knowledge. So in principle, this is enough to simulate. But what I typically do when you simulate, you might want to use a supercomputer. Or you might at least want to do the cluster in the group. And then you might have to wait in line before you can start the simulation. And it's really irritated if I now started a simulation here. And when this starts 14 hours from now in the middle of the night, then it's going to find a small error and immediately exit. So it makes a lot of sense to prepare things now. And if there are any problems in my input files, Gromax will tell me now. And then I have a chance to fix them before we run the actual simulation. Sorry, then I have a chance to fix them instantly. And if all these preparatory steps work, I know that by the time I start the simulation, everything should just be fine. Just as if you have a C preprocessor called CPP, we have a Gromax preprocessor called GroMPP which used to be a separate command, but now this too is part of this GMX command. So GMX go MPP. And if you don't remember what the command does, again, just dash, dash H. Uh, all these commands first have some explanation at the top telling you exactly what the program does in gory detail. Unless you're a really fast reader, you won't be able to follow me there. And then we have at least a short summary of the options. You're not going to learn how to use the program from these options, but once you know how to use the programs, it's really nice to have these as a reminder. So in this case, I take the param the settings, what I want to do as the input. I'm going to need a topology. This is actually the default value. I could skip the default value here, but I won't. And I'm going to need the coordinates. And then I need to write this to somehow. Let's call this EM. I don't give it an extension here. When I don't give something an extension, Gromax uses the default name. And in this case, the default name is TPR, which stands for Topology Runtime. This small file contains everything, literally everything in the simulation. If I wanted to move this to another computer, I would just have to do an FTP of this file. And then I could run this with a different version of Gromax on a different computer, and everything would just work. 
So in particular, once you start running on several hosts, supercomputers and everything, having these pre-processing steps is really nice. The other thing is that this program is by far the pickiest of all of them in Grobex. You are going to swear. But the point is that this saves you time. Because if the program didn't complain, you would get these simulations crashing 14 hours later. And it's so much better to get feedback after one second telling me, sorry, this parameter is not compatible with, with that other parameter. Sorry, we warning you that it looks like your run is going to produce 14 petabytes of output data. Your system administrator is not going to be too happy in that case. It's better to get those warnings and error mistakes right away than seeing them a week later when you're on vacation in Greece. And we can actually run this one here. And running the MD simulation in Gromax is with a command called MD run, which is now a subcommand of TMX MD run. I can add the dash V option to make it verbose to see what happens. And I could specify all the input names and all the output names, but I love an option called DEFFNM for default file name. All my file names will be called EM. And then it will just add the different extensions for what these names should do. And now you see lots of numbers flying by here. I've told it to run up to 1,000 steps of energy minimization. How do I know that 1,000 steps is enough? You know what? I don't. I, I know that 1,000 steps is likely a massive overkill. Because remember, what I said with energy minimization here, we already have a negative potential energy that you see in the middle of the data here. I just want to get rid from those horrible, uh, get away from those horrible peaks in energy. And I think we're already there. The largest forces here are in the ballpark of a thousand kilojoules per moles per nanometer. Yes, the program will say here that we reach the maximum number of steps before the forces reach the requested position. But again, the point here is not to find a perfect minimum, but to rather get away from all those imperfect maximums. I could show you the beginning and end states here but they will look virtually exactly the same. And I will show you that with a quick movie in the presentation here. Have a look here. You're not going to see this changing much. This protein, small motion you're seeing, you're seeing some side scenes move a tiny bit if that survives the video compression even. That is roughly 5,000 steps of energy minimization in a typical protein. So don't worry about whether the energy minimization is distorting your protein or something. This is such a high dimensional energy landscape that it will not really move anywhere at all. That's not the point. The point is to get rid of the peaks. And at this point, you know, I'm ready to start a simulation. But if what would happen if I started a simulation now? Well, this is kind of an ice crystal. Um, the water is certainly going to bump into the protein a little bit. You saw how little it moved. Um, the protein is reasonably equilibrated, hopefully, but it's kind of like taking somebody and throwing them in a water in the water literally so the protein would be a bit upset if we started simulating right away there are a bunch of different techniques to deal with this um, so one common thing is to slowly heat the protein but slowly heating the protein in my opinion that's just like taking a student and slowly putting him in cold water he's not really going to be a whole lot happier because you do it slower it's just he's going to freeze slower he's still going to freeze in Gromax, we do things slightly different. So I'm going to copy another one of these parameter files here uh, called PR.mdp. PR stands for Position Restraints. This is an almost identical file. We can have a look at it. Uh, the only difference here is that I no longer use an energy minimizer as the so-called integrator. The integrator tells us how we update the positions. But here I actually use MD, which is really Newton's equations of motion. Uh, so why don't I want to use MD here? So well, so now I'm at the point that I'm ready to start sampling. The first thing that's going to happen when I start sampling, though, is that the protein will realize that, you know what, site scene 14 is slightly happier in a different conformation. These two helices would like to move slightly away from each other. Now, that's fine if it's part of the protein adapting to another part of the protein. But we probably don't want that site scene moving because I just happened to put a water molecule a bit too close to it. Remember, I added the water. The water was not there in the PDB file. So the way I do that is with something called position restraints in Gromax. So that I take every heavy atom in my protein and tether a small spring to it so that I keep this atom and keep pulling it back to its original position. That's going to be boring because not much will happen. And that's exactly the point. I'm going to start the simulation and show, show you 
GMX, Grow Empathy. The parameters or settings here now is the position restraint simulation. I use the same topology. And the new coordinate here, I can't use the same coordinates. Then I would start off from the same state again. So the coordinate here should now be the end confirmation of the energy minimization. And at the end of each of these simulations or minimization, Gromax always writes a coordinate file for convenience that I can use it for exactly this. So let's see what happens if I prepare this stuff. We were lucky again. These notes, you don't have to worry about it. In this case, I think it's because we have a slight charge on the system. Um, and all these cool quotes at the end, um, yeah, they're, they're a bit of Gromax folklore. Don't worry about them. Uh, that has nothing to do with your simulations. Let's run the simulation because this is going to take just a slightly long. GMX MD run dash V dash default file name PR. There's going to be something in the beginning here I want you to look at, and then I'll explain you what to do. Oops, I did something bad here. What happened? GMX uh, MD run dash V. Let's see what it did here. GMX MD run dash V dash. Um, you know what I did? I did not give my output file name a name, so there was no such file. Let's call it al.pr. Now we have an output. The other output would have been called topol.tpr, which is the full name. Let's see what happens if we run it now. Did you see here that it's saying something about GPUs detected here? So this is on my MacBook. So this is a slow laptop with a slow GPU. But the point here is that if Gromax finds a GPU, it will use the GPU automatically. And we try pretty hard to automatically compile Gromax with GPU support too. One of the nice things with Gromax is that you don't have to care about the GPUs. It's completely automatic. If we enable the GPU, it's because we can run exactly the same simulation as we did on the CPU. So this is just informational that we're using the GPU. It will not affect the simulation in any way whatsoever, apart from finishing in a third of the time. What this simulation now does is that it's running a normal simulation where all the atoms in the system theoretically are allowed to move and adapt to each other, but all the protein simulations are tethered back to their initial position. This is a really efficient way to relax things because all the atoms can move away if they have to, but I'm going to make sure that once they've moved away and adapted, I will draw them back to their initial position. And once they're back at their initial position, they will hopefully be happy again with a very low RMS. The way we do this by default in Gromax, we're going to have an RMS in the order of, well, probably 0.1 angstrom or something. It's so low that it's much lower than the uh, resolution of the X-ray experiment. So for all intents and purposes, you have exactly the same confirmation of your protein when we're done here, but the water or the membrane, whatever you had around it, will have adapted to the protein structure. I'm not going to go through the exact way we specify these things, but that's a setting in these parameter files, uh, and there's quite a lot of documentation available in that online too. I will do one more simulation here. I'm going to copy one called run.mdp. Yes, this is just my way of naming my files. I like to call them run. You might prefer something else. So gmx go mpp dash f run. And now I use tab to complete it, dash p, complete it to the topology. There's only one file that fit the topology pattern here. Dash C for coordinates. Let's see how many files that fit the coordinates. These are all the files in the present directory that I could use at coordinates. Hmm. Let's see, pr.grow sounds good, right? And let's call this run.tpr. And again, since there was no warning here, I can happily ignore everything the command wrote here. I will just trust that things are fine. And then I said gmx md run dash v. So I see some output. In particular, I'm going to see when it will finish. Default file name run. The only difference between this simulation and the last one is that I've now removed these tethers. So now all the atoms are free to move suddenly. And I no longer started to give it a new velocity. Typically, when you start the very first simulation, you might want to give it velocities corresponding to 300 Kelvin or so. In the second step, I usually avoid doing that. Otherwise, you would get a slight bump to the recent velocities. This is going to finish in roughly 30 seconds, which is the world's shortest MD simulation. To get anything productive here, you would, of course, need to have these orders of magnitude longer. Um, this is just 10 picoseconds. 
Although the very first MB simulation that Martin Karpus and Bruce Jelling got a beautiful uh, PNA nature paper for, and it later rendered Martin the Nobel Prize, that was actually 10 picoseconds too. The difference is that theirs was in vacuum, so this simulation is already a factor 100 more complex than some of the simulations that resulted in the first Nobel Prize. It's kind of amazing how fast computers have gotten. So in one second, then we are done. We now have a bunch of files here, and we see some information about the performance here, how quickly this would simulate. Gromax write a couple of different files. We have a file called run.edr, which is the energies. These are really all the information about temperature, statistics, everything except the actual atomic coordinates. And then we have a file called run.xtc, which is a super compressed version of all the atomic coordinates. Both these files are binary, so you can't look at them directly but we can manipulate them with programs. So the first thing we can do is have a quick look at a trajectory here. Uh, and we have a program. This compressed files can be read by VMD, but since I like PyMol, I'm going to convert that into a PDB file. So I'll just do GMX and use a program called trajectory conf. And then I'm going to need two options to it that I won't explain to you in detail. And I will, I will only pick one frame out of 10, or the files would be gigantic. And I'll call that called runtrad.pdb. And I will write the entire system. There's one more thing I will do. Sorry. If we had two hours, I would take you through all these details. But now I'm just going to show you what the result of the small simulation looks like. So what this will now do, it will write a PDB trajectory, which is really one frame, one model in a PDB file. So this is going to be a gigantic file. This is just one tenth of the data in the compressed file, and it's already twice the size. So it's like a factor 20 less efficient to store it. But this file does can do something pretty cool. We can open it straight away in PyMol. VMD works fine too, of course, but PyMol has this beautiful small VCR recordings here. So now I can just look at the simulation here interactively while I rotate it. And you could color it to whatever you liking you wanted to do or anything here. We can also remove something if you would like to do that. But I'm not going to do a PyMol tutorial of this. Uh, obviously, the protein will not move a whole lot in 10 picoseconds, but neither did the original DPTI simulation of Martin Carpets. The other one thing I want to show you in Gromex, which I think is one of the nice things that we've tried to work hard on, is that, of course, when you have this in PDB file, you can use any tool out there. You might say you want to calculate RMSD. There are plenty of good programs that do that. VMD has beautiful plugins. But what I really love with Gromax is the set of analysis tools we have, in particular if you're using Unix or, well, Mac is Unix, so Macs are fine too. So if I would like to calculate, say, the RMSD of my protein compared to the original frame, I can have, do that with a program. GMX, RMS, dash S for the initial. Sorry. All these programs, they need to use this TPR file so that I know all the chemistry distribution, chemistry description. For instance, the names of atoms and their masses, charges. And then this trajectory. And let's just run this through. Then it's asked me that it's, it would like one group here that I should fit things on. And it has correctly identified, say, the C alphas here. That's a good group. I'll pick that one. And then I could, in theory, calculate my RMS for something different. But I will just pick the C alpha RMS D there, too. And then it just ran through 500 frames in two seconds. And this will write the strange file called rmsd.xvg, which contains a bunch of crap information in the beginning. And then you have the actual data. The point of all this crap information is that if you are a Unix, you probably love the XM Grace plotting tool. And with Gromax, I can just open these files directly in XM Grace, and I should directly get labels and everything. And I did get that, although it was on my other screen. Sorry. So in this case, I get a finished plot, not the world's most beautiful plot, but at least you get the, this saves minutes compared to having to load this into, say, uh, GNU plot or Excel or something. And when you're sitting and doing these simulations, you're perfectly producing hundreds of these plots just because you want to look at different things. And I find it really convenient to be able to look at things really quickly. Although here you see the drawback of only simulating 10 picoseconds. We didn't really get away from the starting structure at all. Sorry about that. Far too short. There are probably 50 to 100 different Chromax tools. I literally won't take you through all of them. But I think the point is that 
sit on, make sure you're sitting on Unix. Gromex is available for Windows, but you lose 75% of all these cool features and everything. Uh, so I really, in that case, if you want a gra nice graphical terminal, do what I do and use Macs. So with that, I'm just going to take you through some of the resources and then spend two minutes showing you some of the very advanced stuff. Gromax has a website that does not have the world's most beautiful layout. We're going to fix that, but there is lots of information available there and you can search. The other amazing resource is the GMX users mailing list. Uh, there are hundreds of mails per day here, so you might want to do the digest version. But if you have a problem, mail this to the mailing list. Uh, free, people frequently get an answer in like 120 seconds or something. It's insanely fast and there's an amazing amount of information available there if you just search the mail archives. Justin Lemko is one of our core developers. He has prepared a set of beautiful tutorials on his homepage that I'm linking through here. And they are, one of them is actually the based on the tutorial that I showed you here. These are beautiful click through tutorials. They take them through step by step and you can see what are the exact, exact commands type. And all these have been updated to Gromex 5.2. We have a bunch of new online tutorials coming online, hopefully later this year. Um, they're not quite there yet. And then we try to periodically organize workshops. Uh, we had one in Virginia a year ago. We're going to organize one in Tel Aviv after summer. and. Uh, in particular, if you're interested in organizing something, both I and my colleagues go to the US pretty frequently anyway. So if this happens to fit in our schedule, we're usually happy to spend a day or two on site and try to do a workshop. They usually work best when there are not hundreds of participants, but like 20, 30, 40 or so. So that's pretty much where I'm going to stop to give you a chance to ask questions. Um, the advanced stuff that I just want to at least whet your appetite on, there are the state of the art in simulations today is not really about running one simulation, but trying to run hundreds, thousands, tens or thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of simulations. And this is really where the power of the next generation computers comes in. Fold the approach in folding at home with Markov state modeling really builds on this. Um, I'm not going to have time to take you through what we do there. But the idea here is that by developing these, automating these statistical methods, it's possible to get a really, really accurate description, not just of one simulation, but the entire distribution. What happens on average when this protein folds? What are all the different pathways the protein can take, et cetera? And this is really where simulations are starting to make predictions about function and not just structure. So with that, I will skip two or three slides here, and I'm going to thank a bunch of people, in particular, SP Grid and uh, Jason for hosting this. And then I will be happy to answer any questions you might have. Jason, back to you. Great. Thank you very much, Eric. And uh, if anyone has questions, feel free to send them to me in the chat window. I had uh, one from our from the room here. Um, could you say a little bit about uh, solvation with ions or um, uh, salt during the uh, surgery? Oh, yes. Uh, that, that's an important part. That I We actually do go through that in the tutorial, but I skipped that in the interest of time here. It's not necessarily. A long time ago, the problem with ions is that a charge, in real life, you don't have free charges in this room, right? Charges always occurs in pairs. Uh, in a battery, you never have a free charge. And the problem with that, a free charge will have an interaction that goes as 1 over R, and that doesn't even converge. You can't cut that up. You can cut it up at 100 billion miles. Uh, you would still make an infinitely large error. Um, that has become much less of a problem with model lattice summation methods. I would actually argue today it is fine to simulate a protein even if it is charged. That doesn't mean that it's biologically good. Um, if you have simulating, for instance, DNA, you will need counter charges uh, because those ions will screen the charges in your DNA. Gromex has a program to add those charges, and that does it automatically for you. There are only two important things that I would like to stress there. If you have a charge of four, plus four, or even worse, plus one, don't add one ion because this poor ion will have to sample your entire box. It's going to take forever before that ion has sampled the box. Add 100 millimolar of salt or whatever concentration is biologically relevant because then you might have 100 ions and that's going to be such, so much more efficient sampling. You're going to have fewer artifacts. And the other part is that you need to be careful because these ions might be a very small group of atoms. So you don't want to couple them separately, for instance, say thermostats or anything. So couple the water and ions as one group. Otherwise, in the extreme case, if you had one ion and said that that should be a separate temperature coupling group, you would force that ion to always have a constant velocity because it's going to have a constant temperature. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, we go through that in a whole lot more detail in Justin's tutorials. One sort of uh, related question would be um, lipids in the solution, either lipids in solution themselves or in intact membrane. Yeah. Um, most of the stuff I do is related to membranes. Uh, I, lip, I think lipids is an amazing example where simulations are so useful because the problem with lipids is that they don't have structure. Lipids have average structure. They have lots of average structures that we have tools to say order parameters that we can extract. But an individual lipid doesn't have a structure. Um, the problem with that is that there is no obvious PDB structure of, say, POPC bilayer to go. Actually, there is worse. There is a structure of DPPC, at least, but that's a crystal structure at minus 50 degrees centigrade or something. It's a completely uninteresting space. So with lipids, the first challenge is that you're going to need to use either a tool such as the Charm GUI or VMD membrane builder to build the membrane around your protein, or which is more common that people prefer to start from a previous membrane that we have relaxed as a pure membrane and embed your protein in that membrane. And you know what? That's not really that different from embedding your protein in water as we did here. There are slightly separate tools for it, but fundamentally it's the same process we go through. Uh, the caveat with lipids is that the people who are the people who are lipid geeks are not necessarily protein geeks. So when it comes to lipids, there are a bunch of somewhat strange force fields that are usually highly optimized for lipids. The burger force field is one of them. I would actually argue that the latest charm force field is awesome for lipids too. I haven't tested the amber force field in their latest lipids well enough. So when it comes to lipids, I would encourage you to use Google and surf around at a couple of lipid sites and see what are people using. Don't just the lipids present in your force field is the best one to use. So um, it, Gromax 5 came out, I think, what, August or so of last year. It looks like 5.1 is on the horizon. Do you have, uh, I think it's in. Yes, I, Mark is sitting right, well, Mark is sitting right next to me here and hopefully preparing the second beta release. That should be out in two weeks or so. Um, I have a confession to make here. Gromax version numbers don't necessarily correspond to the changes between them. In hindsight, 5.1 should have been 6.0. We're adding OpenCL support. We're completely overhauling. The, um, these releases tend to be a bit delayed because they always want stuff in them. And in many cases, the releases correspond more to the architectural changes we do inside rather than the way they change in programs. So at some point, I realized the change between 4.5 and 4.6 was gigantic. Um, if there's one thing I can recommend, do upgrade to the latest versions. You probably, you don't, you never want to use the development version for production work. And you might want to, if you, you typically should not change to a new version right in the middle of a project, unless you're really careful in checking that things work. Uh, we try hard to not screw things up, but hey, this is the same thing in an experiment. Uh, the, this is a learning process for me too. Nobody in the world would ever dream, say if you're an electrophysiologist that I'm, pretending that I am on my free time. Uh, nobody would dream of buying a brand new amplifier and just starting to using that without even comparing the results to their own amplifier, right? Yeah. Nobody would dream of using a completely new protocol to uh, create, say, your crystals without comparing the quality to their old crystals. And I think we all, me included, when it comes to computers, we frequently do that. Ah, we use the latest version. That must be better. Um, I, I'm. There have been a few problems in Gromax, but I would argue that Gromax is actually remarkable could be bug-free software compared to lots of others. The one thing that is the difference is that we wash our dirty laundry in the open. Every single bug is present in Redmine. You can search for it. We never, ever try to hide problems. Uh, but with that also comes the responsibility. If you're using this for your next nature paper, check the results against the old results you had that were known good. And don't trust hundreds of millions of core hours and tens of thousands of dollars to computing time that Eric can't make a, have a mistake. That's impossible. Unfortunately, it happens in MD codes just as all other science. So I think the key thing, be careful. Uh, try to apply the same care in a simulation as you would imagine that your experimental colleagues do in the lab. And then I think people will be fine. It's kind of amazing. For the first time ever, we're starting to see simulation papers come out that actually use positive and negative controls. <laughs> And there, it's kind of embarrassing, right? Because it's not, it's not really anything. Uh, so uh, we had one question from uh, from the group. Um, could you comment a little bit on post-translational modifications such as glycosylation or uh, acetylation? Yes. Uh, the computer won't do anything that you don't tell it to do. Um, 
So when it comes to glycosylation, uh, in this case, I know the answer, but so when it comes to glycosylation, the first question, of course, these are slightly different classes of molecules. Um, they are present in lots of force fields, but if you go to the web and start, don't even start by searching for Gromax, because it might turn out that this might be a really important feature and Gromax might have screwed up. They might not have it. So the first thing I would do is say, oh, glycosylation and simulation or glycosylation and force field. And in this case, it's going to turn out that by far the most common place is a force field extension called glycamber, which is an amber extension. So this is not really from the main amber developers, but these are people who are really interested in glycosylation, and they created a slightly alternative version of amber where they have all the glycosylation and things just right. Uh, that force field is not part of the main amber force in the Gromax distribution, but there are Gromax versions of glycamber around. So in that case, just use glycamber and you should be reasonably fine. But in that case, there might have been a force field that just worked in charm. And as much as I like Gromax, if there's one thing I keep telling all the students in my group, don't use Gromax because I use Gromax. If you use Gromax, be a grown-up scientist and take responsibility for your own choices. So whatever tool you use, use Google and see is this really the best tool? Because as nice as fast as a program is, the most precious resource is likely your own time. It's oh, great. Well, with that, uh, I think we'll wrap up. Thank you very much. Uh, and Thanks. It was a pleasure. One, one more thing. Uh, people are more than welcome to send me questions if they have or anything, but I'm going to do the same thing as I tell in all our workshops. If you send me a question, I will, you know, the second or third time you, uh, you send that mail, I will probably finally have time to answer two weeks later. And I, I try to do that. If you post it to the Gromax mailing list, you might very well get an answer in 120 seconds. And that is the one reason I didn't have my email here, but Start there. If you don't get an answer there, shoot an email to me. You will find my email address online. And then a lot of other people will benefit from that because I'm sure a lot of other people have the same That's question. the other point because somebody else can search the archives and find the answer six months later. Great. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. See you. Bye. Bye.